Uh, as they're filing out, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Brandon. Um, I spent about eight years kind of wandering the wilderness of, of financial services and consulting before I saw the light, or I guess what some would say the dark side of games. Uh, and then I ended up at Riot. I actually I interned at Riot out of grad school uh, in, in 2012. Um, and, and I kind of fell in love with the company at that point. It was 600 people, uh, which seems large now. Um, but now we're at, we're at close to 2,000. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and so I've been working on this for the last uh, three years or so, kind of working on building this insights team with some of the riders who are here. And uh, it's, it's been a really humbling experience, just like it is here to stand in front of you and talk to a room of my peers, um, of our peers here. Um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not often that you get the chance to stand up in front of people who are in the same space as you, both within the domain, the vertical, as well as the horizontal, and talk about your work. And I think it's super humbling to see kind of the passion that we have here, that we're all willing to take out you know, a large chunk of our time. People are flying internationally for this kind of stuff. People are, are logged in online. And, and it's just really humbling to be able to speak to all of you. And so I want to thank James. I know he, he left the room because he's already heard this talk a little bit. Um, but I want to thank James in particular because he reached out to me and, and, and had a great conversation with me about content that would be relevant to you um, and gave me confidence that I'd be able to deliver this. So I just want to thank James for that. Um, so, so let's get started now that we've got the people who, who want to stay here for this talk. Um, and I won't be offended if you guys walk out of the room and, and are like, hey, this is boring, you know, move on. Uh, I appreciate the feedback, both physical and uh, written. So please, uh, please give it to me. Uh, that's the only way that I can get better. And that's how all of us can get better as, as a team. So I'm here to talk about Riot Games. And in specific, I'm supposed to talk about insights in our evolution and how we've grown over the last two and a half years or so. And I'm going to walk through an evolving team. So this team is not static, right? It's still evolving. We, we've evolved a lot in the last two and a half years. But what I'm going to talk about is just the beginning of that evolution. We're going to continue this. And so I may talk a little in absolutes. And I may say, like, hey, we've accomplished this. But to be honest, we haven't. We've never fully accomplished what we set out to do because we want to continue to evolve, just like everybody here, to get better and better over time. So a little bit about our company. Uh, this is our mission. We aspire to be the most player-focused game company in the world. And I think when the company started uh, by Mark and Brandon back in 2006, 7, you know, this was a little revolutionary. The idea of putting the player first instead of revenues first, instead of publishing first, was, was, was just revolutionary at that time. But now, what I see across the entire industry, I see it here at EA with players first. I see it at Activision as well. I see it across all of the game studios and publishers. People understand now that if you put the players first, if you put their experience first, everything else follows. Success follows. The revenues eventually will follow. And I think that that's a great evolution of our industry, and that we've really come into our own in thinking about experience as being super important, and the player as being the pinnacle of what you know, their experience. That's what we need to strive for, to make it the best possible. And, and I love that about this industry, that we're evolving as well. So a little bit about Riot. Uh, we're based in sunny Los Angeles. Um, we're in West LA. This is uh, some pictures from our new headquarters. If any of you are ever in the Southern California region, feel free to stop by. Uh, happy to show you our, our lab. It's uh, definitely not as technologically advanced as the EA Games or, or Sony Studio Labs, but happy to show it to all of you. Uh, and then also happy to you know, take you guys down to the beach, show you the wonderful weather. Uh, LA is about you know, 15 degrees warmer than uh, Northern California right now. And it stays that way throughout the rest of the year. So please come on down. Come visit us. Uh, we love sharing our space with others. So why do we need a headquarters you know, with all of this fancy stuff? Well, it's because we have a lot of people now working at Riot. Uh, as I mentioned, when I joined, it was around 650. We've got approximately 2,000. I heard a couple of gasps. That sounds like a lot of people, right? But you have to realize about Riot, one of the things is that we are vertically integrated. So we are a studio as well as a publisher. And I think that's what's the most important kind of unique aspect about, about our size, which is we want to be as close to the player as possible to get that player focus. And so as a result, we distribute these 2,000 Rioters across 17 offices around the world. Uh, so we're everywhere. We're on most continents, uh, Oceania, Asia, South America, North America, Europe. Um, we are missing, of course, some key continents, right? Um, as you can see, Africa, uh, Antarctica, 
Um, but eventually we'll get there. Uh, and the idea is we want to place people, right, riders close to the players. And this is, this is what we've done. So why do we need this many offices? Why do we need this many people? It's because of our game, League of Legends. And right now, just to give you a sense of size and scope, we have approximately 70 million monthly active players. Of those, 30 million log in on a daily basis, or around 30. And we have a peak concurrent uh, user base of around 8 million. Um, and so whenever China and Korea turn on the lights, that's when our concurrency goes up, and that's when we hit our peak. Um, like, like many games today, right, it's really driven a lot by the East Asian market, right? And we, we have a home base here of creativity, but really a lot of our players are in the Asian market because they're voracious, right? Games is part of their culture. Last but not least, uh, before I move on to insights, uh, eSports is in our DNA. So we are very much an eSports company. When it was founded, Brandon and Mark were very much, hey, I want to watch other people play games at a high level. And we've continued that to date. And this is, uh, this is a picture from our world championship um, three years ago. Anyways, now that we have the background out of the way and everybody's on the same page, let's talk about what we came here to talk about, which is how do we, as a group, provide advisory, provide research, provide analytics in a better and more holistic fashion? And this is what we came up with as insights. And this is our mission. And I'll talk a little bit about how we came to this mission, but I want to deconstruct it a little bit. So we strive to empower riders to make player-informed strategic decisions and data-powered products. And so each line is important to us. Number one is we strive to empower. So we are advisors first and foremost. We're not on the front line. We're behind the developers. We're behind the product managers. We're helping them get better. The second line is about strategic decisions. We're not just here to fetch you a number. We're here to help you make a better decision. And then number three, we don't just help decisions. We actually build products ourselves that are based off of information and data. And how do we do that? We do that with a team that comprises you know, of these four different sub-disciplines. And so they're analytics, which is your traditional business intelligence. They are data science, which applies statistical methods and machine learning to generate products and behavioral models. They're research, which is actually a combination of user research and market research. And last but not least, a technology team, which helps us uh, ingest, store, process, and serve up all of that information. And I think this is kind of the magic. Uh, when, when you come down to it, it's not about fancy slides or about missions. It's about the people who make up this team. And these are the people. And so this is who we are as insights. But we didn't get here overnight. As I mentioned, this has been a three-year journey. And sometimes it's been painful, and I'm going to share some of that pain. And sometimes it's been great and glorious and wonderful, and I'll share that as well. So I'm going to start off our journey by, by using an image that's really near and dear to me. Uh, I grew up playing Lego. Did, did anybody else grow up playing Lego? Yes. That's why these Lego games are so great, right? They just like get to the core of you as a child. And so for me, when I look at this picture, I think this is exactly where we started. Um, uh, this is also combining Lord of the Rings, and I love Lord of the Rings. I, I'm, I'm a big token fan. Um, so we start here. We're, we're not Frodo at the beginning of this journey. Right? We, as researchers, as analysts, we're actually, we want to be Gandalf. We want to be this wise sage who's seen a lot, who knows a lot, who knows the path ahead, who knows the journey, and nudges this person, who, who gives them the right information, the right guidance at the right time to get them on this journey towards a better outcome. That's who we want to be. We don't, we don't have to be on the front line. We could. We're, we're, we're probably intelligent enough that if all of us started coding, we'd generate a game right here. But we don't do that, right? We, we relish in being that trusted advisor. And that's what we want to be. We want to be these trusted advisors for everybody. And trusted is a key underlying word, right? We want to be that person who people turn to for advice, for that sage advice. And so we wanted to do that three years ago. And we had lots of issues. And these were the three main issues um, that popped up. Oops, sorry. Um, that popped up. So one, we were disjointed. And I'll walk through each of these and how we tried to solve them over time. The second thing was we were on the outside, so we weren't part of these teams. The third thing, we were acting as a service and not as advisors. And these were three core issues that we had to solve if we wanted to be that Gandalf, if we wanted to be the trusted advisor. So the first one, let me give you some, some background. So in 2012, when I was interning, this is what actually 
um, all of our groups look like. We were all disjointed and separated, spread across seven different teams. Actually, there are more teams than this. But for the sake of simplicity, there, there were seven here. And on top of that, we were siloed. So some of us were in player experience, some of us were in publishing, some of us engineering, and we never talked. Right? We talked occasionally, we crossed the lines a little bit, but this was bad. So how can people trust us as advisors if we weren't unified? Uh, I interned actually as, as, a, as a product manager, and when I went to actually help launch the product, which was our Turkey region, I had to go to seven different teams in order to make sure I got my information. And then I had to piece it together. And then I had to be the one. And, and so, you know, there's a lot of I in there. And like, look, that's a lot to put on an intern. Like, I, I screwed it up, right? I didn't piece it together well. Our launch wasn't great as a result of that. I needed a better advisor to help me really understand the demographics in Turkey and what was going on. And so that's what I needed. And so when I came back around full time to really help out with insights, I brought that with me. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to really unify this. So how do you do that, though? These teams, some of them had been around for years. Their culture had been calcified. How do you reboot the culture and organization? And I think that's, that's one of the hardest things that, that we face, that I'm sure a lot of you face when you're trying to do this. How do you do that? Well, I, I'm a big fan of Lord of the Rings. And as, you know, that stems from a childhood in which I read a lot of Greek and Roman mythology. Uh, does anybody know what um, this, this image is from? Can anybody wager a guess? Pardon me? Yes, Trojan War. Um, so this is Achilles. He's the one in the chariot. And he is dragging around Hector's body. Uh, and this was all because of this beautiful woman named Helen. Um, there's this huge war erupted. And the reason why I bring this up is because when you study Greek mythology, when you study how culture is passed on, there's really three things which really enable us to do that. And that's symbols, stories, and structures. And so the symbol in this story, you know, Achilles is eventually taken down, I think, by Paris because he has, this, and I'm sure all of you are jumping to this, because he has the Achilles heel. And this is a symbol that the Greeks used for like, look, everybody's got a weakness. You just have to find it. So be aware of your weakness. This is a symbol. There was a story told, the Iliad, right? Had this huge story about this entire thing. And that story was passed on to really reinforce a lot of the lessons that are, that are taught there. And then last but not least, there are structures. So there was the Olympics. There's other venues for these people to come together to share many of these stories. And that's what we set out to do. We set out to create our own set of symbols, stories, and structures. So what we did was we spent two months prepping for this offsite where we took uh, a bunch of our folks here, we, we, we sequestered them in this, in this conference room for an entire day, and we extracted everybody's thoughts on values, on culture, on what we should be doing. And we came up with our own symbols, we came up with some of our stories, and we created the roots to some of our structures. So for symbols, I apologize for the font, um, I'm a MacBook user. Uh, so I had to try to translate it to Windows. Um, and so we came up with our mission, which is our symbol, right? And this mission has evolved over the last three years. It started off just talking about, hey, we empower others. And then it became about decision making. And then it became about products. So it's evolved over time, and it's ever evolving. But it serves as a symbol for us as a litmus test. Whatever we do, we hold it up to this symbol. And if it makes sense, then that's great. The other thing we have is we get together on a regular cadence. We get everybody together to talk about stories, about success, about failure. And these stories become lore. Uh, for example, we have uh, one, one lead analyst. Uh, we always talk about the story about being kind of go-getter, right? And, and being, being out there and trying to, trying to make an impact. And this person actually queried uh, the master using SQL, uh, queried the master when League of Legends had just launched and actually crashed the master. Now, we talk about this because, yes, it is in some ways a funny failure. Like, this person brought down the entire platform because they ran a query which had bad joins in it. But it, it, it's a symbol for us. It's a story which shows, like, hey, you need to be out there trying your best to deliver value. And that's a story that we tell. We also have a bunch of structures. Um, you know, we've got, we've got how we're structured today, right? We simplified from seven down to four. Uh, we also have these monthlies where we get together and we share our identity 
Um, and that's all 70 of us coming together. We started off with 20, now we're at 70. All 70 of us flying in to spend time together to reinforce our identity, to talk about stories, to look at our symbols and reevaluate them. And last but not least, I think one of the, the newest additions to our structures is this idea of this operations team. This team is really the glue that really holds all of us together you know, and makes sure that we are doing the right thing, that helps us with recruiting, that helps us with logistics, coming to this conference, things like that. And so as a result of these symbol structures and these stories, we're now unified. We have this, this foundation of trust amongst all of us. But we were still on the outside, and we're still acting as a service. So <clears throat> we had this foundation. We're doing well. Right? We're answering. Some of us are embedded, which is great. But many of us are centralized in this central model. And we did really well. Right? I mean, all these people are coming to us. People are like, wow, this is, there's this new way of thinking where I get a unified point of view. And people love that. And so as a result, we had increasing demand. But the problem with that was we were still centralized and we had increasing demand. So we couldn't really spend enough time with each individual. At that point, we lacked alignment. Right? We lacked alignment with our teams that we were servicing because we just had so many. We couldn't prioritize. As a result, we lacked conf you know, context. And last but not least, we had no influence. And that's not great. So what's, what's the normal answer here when you've got a central team and your demand has increased? Yeah, you hire more people, right? And, and that's exactly what we try to do, right? We try to, we try to inject the, you know, the, the steroids of organizational growth, right? Higher, higher. We got, we got a ton of people uh, to help us source externally. Um, but the problem with this is that, and I think David just did the, the math for us uh, last week, it takes 100 hours to hire an individual uh, at Riot. Um, Hopefully everybody else has an easier path to that. But because of the way that we hire and, and our quality bar and everything, it's, it's hard for us to uh, hire quickly. So we can't just juice it. Yes, we've hired. We've grown from 25 to 70 now in the last three years. But we still need to hire more. So, so what do you do instead? And what we did was we looked around at other groups which had encountered this same issue. And what did they do, actually? So they actually went down this path of called embedding. So what this means is that for a particular product team, you take people from each of, the, each, each of the horizontals and you embed them on there. And most game teams are like this, right? There's a product manager, there's devs, there's you know, engineering, uh, art, uh, dev management. We saw that that was a pathway for us to get closer, to be on the inside. So we set up a hybrid model where we had both a centralized group and an embedded group. Um, now, when we were doing this, actually, people within Insight, some of us had doubts. They're like, what, like, what, like, what are you going to do? You're going to take our people, and you're going to embed them somewhere else? What's going to happen Century? We're already buried with work. And thankfully, what we saw was the workload, the demand for our Central team actually dropped as a result of us embedding more. And this started working out. Now, there's some fundamental questions that arose when we were doing this that, that we had ourselves, that people asked of us. And I'll, I'll walk through them. I think one question is, for embeds, how do we know that they're going to be effective? How do we know that your embed, who you've now separated from their manager in a product, is going to be good, is going to deliver a lot of value, right? I mean, that's, that's a scary thought. When, you know, uh, when, when, you're, when your manager's away, they don't have as much support right, as the IC. And as the manager, you just don't have as much visibility. Well, one of the things that we did was we first started off embedding at the product level. And you know, this is for the embed's effectiveness. And we quickly realized that they needed more and more context to be viewed as part of the inside. So we went to the initiative level. An initiative is a logical grouping of products. I'll give you an example of a product. That's like a champion in our game. Another product would be a map. An initiative is a logical or strategic grouping of products. So gameplay encompasses both champions as well as the map. And so we started embedding at the gameplay level, which was great. These people understood what was happening in gameplay. We had embeds at the product level. So we had it both ways, which was great. Right? We had this great strategic alignment now. But what we were also missing was the game. And this is where we've only recently 
as in this past year, uh, not even year, past several months have started to do this. We've embedded at the highest level now, sitting next to our senior most product managers. And now we've got embeds at the game, at the initiative, at the product level. And for us, this was key. Because if you're not embedded at the highest level of decision making, you don't have the scope to figure out what to do at the lowest level as well. You need to understand from top to bottom, from bottom to top, what you're doing. And that really makes your embeds much more effective. That also provides them much more accountability structure with the product leads. The other thing that we're starting to do now is reevaluating our placement every three to six months. We just had um, one of our largest uh, kind of push for content over this past six months or so, and the next six months will be equally as large. And it's the largest that we've ever kind of pushed out to the live game. And we had one researcher who was really helping us out with a lot of that. And he was doing really great work. We've actually pulled him now, even though he's integral to that process, we've pulled him and placed him in an R&D project because we feel that his development, that the value that he's gonna deliver is long-term gonna be higher over there than embedded in League of Legends. And so this is an example of us trying to live this. Now, it doesn't work all the time. Some people develop a body of knowledge that you wanna keep. So we face the challenge of having to replace people. But that's a challenge that I think David and myself and the rest of the leads here at Riot are, are willing to undertake. The other question is for central people, won't they get left the scraps, right? You've embedded all these people. League, you know, for us, League of Legends is great, staffed up. Your, your flagship product is staffed. What happens to central? And you know, I will admit that, uh, yes, to some degree, central doesn't get as much of the kind of cool, sexy projects as before when it comes to League, right? They're, not, they're cut off completely, actually. They're focused on everything else. But what they do get to work on is company-wide needs. And I think that these are some of our, our sexiest projects. These are some of our, our most intriguing projects. And I'll give you an example of some of them. So an example is player segmentation. Really, just really understanding our players as they move from property to property. Competitive analysis. Understanding what you folks are doing. right? Understanding all of that. Cross-game economy study. Regional variation study. And of course, R&D. And so instead of having a central service team, we now have a center of excellence where we've got some of our brightest people who are working on some of these things. And that then propagates out to all of the embeds. As we create something foundational like player segmentation, that's used by all of our embeds throughout all of League and other games. So this next slide I wanna show you, on the y-axis we've got the number of riders, on the bottom axis, x-axis, we've got the year, and we've got the embed. So this is the number of people that we're actually embedding, right, or that we have to embed, and we've got the forecast. So the forecast is generated by our product managers, and our product managers are the ones who are demanding you know, our services or not. And I'll show you this curve over time. <clears throat> so when we started out, the, the forecast was below. Nobody knew that they needed an embed, really. And so when we started embedding, over time, what's happened is our product managers have given us the vote of confidence, right? They're voting with their pocketbooks, right? They want us to embed more. And so that's really given us confidence that we're doing the right thing. So we have trust. We have alignment now with our product teams. The last one was we were acting as a service. So this is like a common question that a lot of us as researchers and analysts get. Something like, hey, can you get me the results for this? Or, or, or let me know how that turned out. And our, our natural inclination is always to dive into this. Hey, yeah, sure, here's the report with the, you know, with the lab results and the analytics. Go for it. Right? And we drop it off on their desk via email or, or however, you know, paper, if people still do that. Um, and, and, and that's our natural inclination because we want to be helpful. We want to be that trusted advisor. Right? We want to give answers. That's wrong. We should never do this. We should always ask why. We should always dig in. And I think my mentor told me this. Um, he gave me this advice when I was being really, really quiet uh, when I first started off as a consultant. He said, hey, you were present, but you didn't have a presence. And I think that's what we were engaging in. Not everybody. I'm making some generalizations. But some of our folks were thinking too much like, hey, I just have to get this answer, and that's it, instead of questioning the validity of the ask. And so the question is, how do we move beyond this historically weak pull and non-existent push relationship? And by I mean weak pull, I mean our product managers 
our stakeholders, they weren't educated enough to ask the right questions. They didn't know what information we had. They didn't know what we were capable of. And so they were asking very generic questions. Hey, get me the results. Hey, can't you just run a survey? Isn't that so easy? Um, hey, what about a lab? Just get a bunch of people in and point a camera at them and ask them a bunch of questions, right? Like, they're not educated enough, right? Um, can't you just query the master, right? I mean, like, so there's, there's, there's people, they need education. So what did we do to help them with that? We did three things. We actually embedded even more. So we took more people and we threw them in because the embeds are our greatest teachers. The second thing we did was we built an education program. So we have Data 101, which our ops team has helped launch uh, in conjunction with uh, some of our, our managers. It's, it's a program that we've launched in conjunction with product management, with game design, to educate everybody on how to use data, on the fact that correlation does not equal causation, and those kinds of things. The other thing that we've done is also taste the insight. So it's almost like a science fair-like activity where we get people similar to this conference where we get a bunch of beers and people get to walk to all of these TED Talks, right, which are all given by insights folks, and it really sparks the creativity and the imagination. And then from there, they go and they find their embed and they're like, hey, I saw this really interesting presentation. Like, let's have a conversation about it. This other thing that we've done uh, is we've launched a knowledge platform. So we have this knowledge platform now called Bloomfire. Uh, who here uses Confluence? So there's a lot of hands. And so Confluence is one of the most clunkiest ways to share information. Now, it's great for Wiki. It's great for engineers who want to code and comment and all this stuff. But for people like us, researchers and analysts, like, it doesn't make sense, right? Uh, putting a PowerPoint presentation there, it gets hidden behind all these links and the search is terrible. So for us, we launched Knowledge at Riot, and that's been really beneficial to us. And we've seen super high engagement in that. It's, it's a great social platform to share a lot of our results. So what about the weak push, where, where we weren't focusing on educating as much, we weren't pushing our ideas on strategy, on product as much? Well, what we did was we recognized that there were a bunch of roles that we needed to fulfill. And so if we look out across all of these other groups, they all have like a lead product manager or a lead designer or a technical architect, right, or the art director, these individuals who are leads who are really representing their horizontal in this product and pushing for their agenda. We didn't have those roles solidified. And this is something that we're still working on. Um, we, we have these two roles now that we think that we need called delivery lead and strategy lead, where delivery lead is really helping us get better at delivering, right? It's the nuts and bolts of how you deliver better insight. And then we've got strategy lead, somebody who knows the game inside and out, knows that game system, and can, and can talk about what exactly we need, can talk about data structures, research, everything that needs to be done. Now, we screwed this up. I'll, I'll be 100% honest. What we did is we hired somebody. Um, um, he's, he, he's still at Riot, don't worry. Uh, we hired Omid, right, who's this great McKinsey engagement manager, and he came in guns blazing, you know, like, hey, all right, guys, I'm going to be the delivery lead, I'm going to be the strategy lead, I'm going to do it all. And what we found out was that, like, look, you people are the smartest people in the world. You don't need somebody who's leading from the front, you need somebody who's leading from the back. And so these roles have morphed now, not so much into a leader, really, but a support. This person is meant to give all of you guidance, is meant to make sure that your work is exposed. And once we flip that model on its head, it started working out. And so that's how we fixed our push, is that we have this person who's really advocating for you and really helping you deliver better. Um, it's still a work in progress. We're not there yet. Uh, but Omid is working out, and I, I think he's doing a great job. So. So we became advisors, which is great. Or we're becoming advisors. And this is just a quote from Joe Tung. Uh, he's our League of Legends lead producer. Uh, for those of you who are from Bungie, uh, you may recognize his name. He was the uh, EP for, I think, Halo Reach. And so th he had to write this about our strategy lead, Sai, in League of Legends. Uh, I trust Sai implicitly to tell me where I'm screwing up and what's the best course of action. If you take Sai away, I might have to hurt you. So I actually had to edit this out. Um, he used some stronger language, and he actually wrote this in our performance review for Sai. So it's, it's sitting on a system forever in perpetuity now. Uh, there were some choice words in there. Um, but so I think, I think this, this idea of having somebody push Joe 
and Joe pushing back in that relationship really developed a symbiosis that has been really fruitful for Insights as well as for Joe and League of Legends. So we achieved all these somewhat, as I mentioned, right? We're still evolving. We're not finished. Um, but, you know, I'll bring it back to this, right? I, I think this is what we eventually be came to. We realized, like, hey, we're not just the one Gandalf, we're the fellowship, right? We're here helping everybody, right? Helping a multitude of people, but with our different strengths. And that's what Insights really is at the end of the day. It's a group of individuals who believe in the same thing that all of you believe. Right? that information should help make better decisions. And we came together to really help you know, our game devs, our producers, our designers, everybody. Now, disclaimer, this journey that we had isn't for everybody. We have a unique organizational structure being vertically integrated and, and other things. The other thing, too, is that it's super costly to maintain identity. You can think about our model. We have three, at least three identities that you have to maintain. You've got your insights identity, you've got your product identity, you've got your riot identity. Actually, there's a fourth, which is your sub-discipline, right? If you're in research or analytics, that's a lot of identities, and that's tough to do. The other thing is going native is a risk. It always is when you embed. When you put somebody in a product, you know, they may just get so wrapped up in the product that they're like, hey, I'll do whatever the product manager says, right? Because they're effectively my manager. And so we really have to manage this delicate relationship to make sure that that doesn't happen. The other thing too is once you start embedding, you can't address as many problems. I had to tell no to a lot of people. Many of you may have read um, Jeffrey Lin or Riot Light's uh, uh, presentations or seen them at GDC on toxic behavior. He's one of our most influential designers. I had to tell him no straight for six months when he asked for more researchers because I had embedded them all, right? Or analysts and data scientists. Last but not least, we need to constantly evolve in this model. In a matrix, products are shifting, they are launching, and then that team is falling apart and then reconstructing itself over and over and over again. So as a result, if you're going to embed, you need to make sure that you are as nimble as the product teams that you embed with. So we built a foundation of trust, we embedded to create alignment, and we became a presence. And all of that led us to being a trusted advisor. And now when we take a trusted advisor status and you mix that with your player and form mission, that's how Riot and that's how we have helped Riot become more player focused. And so with that, uh, I'd like to end and I think we've got seven minutes and open it up for any questions. And uh, feel free to email me with any. Hi, excellent talk. Uh, you mentioned uh, you got a lot of feedback from your mentor. Can you talk about how that process works at Riot? Is it just your manager, or do you have some sort of program where you are getting guidance when you're onboarded? Yeah, so when you join Riot, actually, you have your manager, who is definitely your mentor, but then you also get a buddy. And that buddy is assigned to you based on what you're about to do. And so I was assigned, uh, um, actually, an individual named Steve Snow, who is a, a producer for one of our games. He's been there a long time. Uh, and so he gave me a lot of feedback on, on me and, and making me better. So the other thing, too, is that we encourage all of our folks to seek out mentors that are not in your discipline. Yeah. Good question. Hi. Um, so my question is that you talked about embedding individuals on the Insight team onto all of your other, like... Products. Yep. Um, so... In terms of the strength of the product, how big it is, do you have to allocate more embedded individuals into those into those products? Um, so, for example, I know you guys reworked your queue system. Um, was that like a large product that you had to tackle with more people um, versus, or did you just use yeah. the same amount versus? And that's a that's a great question. And if I would distill it, I think it's about like how does allocation occur, right, for our embeds as well as for central and. It's, uh, it's, it's not a clear-cut answer. It's really this intersection of three things that we want to try to hit every single time. And the first thing is, you know, what is the value to Riot? Of 
course, right? And so example is like our new Q system was a huge feature that we recently launched, uh, very integral to our future success. So lots of value if somebody works on that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, the other two things are, one is the, va the, the passion that the individual has, right? So if the person isn't passionate about Q systems, like we don't wanna force them to work on something they're not passionate about because they're not gonna do a good job. And we've seen this, we've tried this actually. And, and I'll be honest, it's led to some attrition, which, has, which you know, keeps me up at night. Uh, the third thing that, that kind of intersects with that is their growth. And so uh, we, we have to look at these three things intersecting. And we don't always get it right, to be honest, right? Um, at the end of the day, though, you know, um, we always talk about we're in it for the long term, right? We're not in it to win the one game. We're in it to win the match, the season, build the dynasty. So we tend to optimize for long-term growth over the other three. And that's led to some sticky conversations with product managers. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? Hey. Um, so for your embeds, how do you deal with the complexity of uh, management and reporting between insights and then the, the product owners? Uh, yeah. The matrixes can become tricky. Yeah, I'm, I'm smiling um, because D David, uh, David's right here. I don't know whether you want to raise your hand. Uh, uh, so David, myself, and several others have been sequestered in rooms just thinking about this for a while. And you know what? The answer is it's going to be messy, right? You, you, have, you essentially have two managers when you embed. You've got your product manager, and then you've also got your discipline manager. And now we're introducing this idea of this delivery lead as well. So really, you've got three individuals who you now can turn to. And what we need to do is really clarify those three roles, right? At the end of the day, though, what we would like to have, what we aspire for, is, is that your manager is not in your product. The reason why is we want you to walk into that product manager's room, desk, wherever they're sitting, and be like, you're doing it wrong. And feel that you're going to be rewarded for that, for telling the truth, instead of having to go native, right, and try to align interests and those kinds of things. Your interests are the best for the company, not necessarily for that product, if that makes sense. And so that's kind of where our management where we would like it to be centered, more on the discipline, so that they have that third-party um, separation. Yeah. How do the PMs feel about that? Uh, some of them, like Joe, actually, Joe's like, I, you know, just give me Sai, you know, I'll just, I'll throw oodles of money at him so he never leaves, you know. And so a lot of our PMs are like that. They're like, hey, I want control, right? A lot of them want control all the time. But the good thing is that we're not the only one who's matrix, right? As you saw. Everybody else is matrix. So uh, there's already this, this establishment of, of um, process where your manager is outside. Um, it's one of the things that we're going to have to fight with uh, as we grow even larger. Um, as I mentioned, we've got 70 folks. Half of them are in advisory, and half of them are building products. Um, and so as we grow larger, it's going to be harder and harder to maintain that, actually. So it's a good question. I know there's a question up front here, and then there's one back there as well. Right? Do you have? I think we have time for two more. Yeah, it's a pretty simple question. Just what do you think your biggest weakness is now that you've made all these changes? Um, my personal weakness is I'm very bad at details and telling people what to do. Uh, and, but when you think about uh, uh, insights as weakness, I think the biggest thing is that we've hired some very, very talented ICs, right? People who are embedded, people are doing great work. And we haven't spent enough time uh, growing the people who want to grow into these kind of lead roles. You know, and I think that's our biggest challenge. We've got several budding stars. Uh, some of them are here at this conference. And, and it's really great, right? But we haven't poured enough time in them. So I think that's our biggest challenge. How do you convert an IC into a leader and not have to force them to be a manager, right? The guru path. And I think that's one of our biggest challenges going forward. Yeah. I think there's... Thanks for the talk. This structure that you um that you put out 70 people in a company of 1700 how do you think it changes as the company gets bigger or smaller for example if there were just 10 researchers and the company was 10 times smaller would you do something differently or could you scale this down yeah so i think i think the idea is that in, in a 10 in a 10 person or 100 person company where you got 10 people um you actually start off as a service like it's not a bad thing because you know, if you're 10 people in a 100-person company, you know everybody. You know what's going on. You have context. You have alignment, right? Or if you're like the first researcher to show up at like at say a growing indie studio, you, you you're already in, right? You don't have to worry about a lot of this. What this was, we had a model 
that worked when we were at 200 people. But when we scaled up, it was impossible. And we needed to scale right, how we embed it to generate that context. So yeah, it's an S-curve, definitely. Um, and for those of you who are in service models, it's not a bad thing. It all depends on your context and how you're structured. And so for us, this was, this was the way that we had to evolve, or at least we feel we had to evolve. So I think, I think we're out of time. And hey, I really appreciate you guys voting with your feet and staying here and listening. Um, this is my email address. Feel free to email me any questions. And then also uh, myself and some of the other writers will be around if you have any questions about anything that I've talked about. Thank you.